We're live. We are. Aurora, it's a pleasure to have the Secretary of State for Defence with us today and his team to give evidence uh, to the committee. Um, Secretary of State, do you want to just start by introducing the, the team you with you today? Well, sure. Here with the Permanent Under Secretary. David, do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, well, David Williams, uh, Permanent Secretary uh, at the Ministry of Defence. Uh, Tom Whippleman, Director for Strategic Finance, Ministry of Defence. Lieutenant General Rob McGowan, Deputy Chief of the Defence Staff for Military Capability. Good to see you all. Uh, Kevin's going to kick us off with the first question. Yeah, I think you'd expect us to start with the budget. Um, and since the budget on the 6th of March, there's been some uncertainty whether or not defence uh, expenditure is rising or being cut next year. So an open question to start with. Could you clarify what the position is? I kick off and then hand over to uh, Tom. So I think the confusion on the day is that when the Treasury publishes their numbers, they, uh, you're not comparing apples with apples. You're comparing apples with oranges because they publish the entirety of the outcome, the outturn of the previous year, 23-24, including supplementaries, uh, which includes things like Ukraine expenditure, for example. Um, and then when you see the figures for 24-25, on the day in the book, it doesn't include the supplementaries, even though everyone knows, because the government's already committed to it, that, for example, that's £2.5 billion, pounds, uh, and then money for munitions as well, £280 million for stockpiles. Once you add those two things in, which are then comparing the outturn of last year to what will be the outturn of this year for certain, uh, you get a 1.8% real terms increase right. from £1.4 so billion. Right. Pound what you're basically saying is what's in the red book figures. It's misleading because it doesn't include a footnote that says that doesn't include supplementals. Oh, well, let's get a clarify then. So for, let's do Ardell first. So in, according to the Red Book, uh, for 22-23 it was 30.5 um, and then for 23-24 it's 35 uh, and then for 24-24 plans, 24-25 uh, it's 32.8. So what are the figures, then, taking out what you've just said on uh, the uh, figures for 2022, 23 and 24? Yeah, so to compound those <coughs> figures, you end up with a 54.2 billion the previous year and a 55.6 this year. But no, I know you want to get into the details, so I'm going to ask Tom to no, no, I'm doing give you the actual I'm doing numbers. it deliberately separate between... Oh, okay. because I know in your tweets you have a tendency to conflate, and Ardell. Well, and conflate things that frankly don't add up, but go on, carry on. So, um, Mr Jones, so if you look at <coughs> the 23-24 number is our outturn, which, yep. was, uh, which reflects the supplementary estimate published in February. Got that. Got that. Uh, the Ardell um, 35 billion compares to plans. No, can, from I, can, I, can I just stop you? Yeah. Right. So the Secretary of State just said the 32.5, and you've just said, and I understand that, has got supplementary. What is the figure stripping that out? That's what we're trying to get to. So, sorry, uh, do you mean 22 23? Well, let's start with 22 23. So that is, tw that is 32.5. That is the outturn from that year. But that includes. What the Secretary said, you just said. <coughs> yes. So the outturn, yes. So the outturn for 22-23 yeah. includes the additional spend. Got all that in that year. You don't expend it. We've got that. Right. Strip that out. Then what was the figure for 22-23? Uh, because that's the only. What you're saying is, is the supplementaries really skew things. So you can't, as the Secretary said, you said you're not doing ap uh, apples and oranges. No. So what we really needed to get to is what is the strip out all the supplementaries in 2022-23 to get a baseline and then go on to 2023-24 to see what that is with stripped out all the... That's, that's how we're going to get and that's what we would need. Mm. I do understand the question. I think, if, if I may, um, I would suggest if we, if we could do it the other way around, starting from 24-25, and the reason for that is that the outturns that you see... Um, reflect the, the things that went in in that year. Look, Murray, you don't, you don't need to explain that. We've got it. Okay. Right. What we're trying to get to is, which is what the Secretary said, we're trying to get to is what is the baseline in terms of take out all the supplementary things that mm -hmm. uh, we actually want to get what the baseline, the way, way, way you can tell whether it's increased or decreased is so you must have a figure. We take all that out for 2002 to 2023. So we've got that baseline. 
then get the same figure with everything stripped out for 2023 24 and you compare them two together, you can see whether it's increased or decreased. If, if, if I may, Mr. Whitman may want to correct me, but the number that we focus on or manage in the department is our expectation of the budget after supplementaries each year. And the data we then report, and I think we probably have to hand with us, is the outturn for previous years, including those supplementaries. We can answer the question you want, but it requires to go back to the main estimates for each well, of those wait, previous wait, yeah, years. Well, and I don't think we have the main estimates. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, though. But if you talk about transparency with the public and Parliament, <coughs> the Secretary of State, Mr uh, Whipperman, has just argued that it's increasing, right? Now, according to the book, it's not increasing. It's not. Now, what we need to know, and what, he, what the Secretary has just said, is the only way really to do it is to strip out the supplementaries. And that's where we need to get to. So why can't you produce those figures? Because that's the only way we can, no disrespect to you, uh, say that what the Secretary of State and you're saying is correct. Well, it's just that the matter of record for previous years is the audited figures from the NAO, which is the end of year out oh. that includes oh. the supplementaries. The, my, so our proposal is yeah. easier to compare 24-25 with our expectation of what's going to be in the supplementary yeah. estimate yeah. rather than the, yeah. the, the book figure. We, oh. we could answer, we could answer the, the start point of each year. It's just that would be the figure approved by Parliament in main estimates each year, yeah. but it's not particularly a number we plan against because we expect it to change. Uh, and I just don't think we've got. Well, I have. Well, I, I've got, so I do have. Well, a, these figures there. It's going down. So, so I do have a T down number, which I which I don't have the Ardell Cedar split, and we what? can run. So the total budget, so Ardell and Cedar combined, yeah. uh, twenty two twenty three. These are nominal, so they're not adjusted. But twenty two twenty three, forty nine point nine billion. Forty nine point nine billion prior to prior to uh, reserve funding. Mm -hmm. 23, 24, 51.5, 24, 25, 51.6. Oh, what was the last one? 51.6. Those are totals, so that's Ardell and Cedell prior to um, agreed reserve uh, claims that took place during those years. Those are nominal, they're not real, so they are. It's nominal, so it's pre inflation. inflation. So pre inflation. So, actually, that's not. It's just all. 49.9 to. 51.6. Those, those are the numbers, Tom. That's right. Uh, okay, in so total spend prior to... That's, actually, that's probably a reduction in real terms. Yeah. What, what in inflation? The following year is. Yeah. It is a reduction in real terms, you take inflation. But what within that, those figures you've just given us not is not core expenditure? I mean, is that included in that, for example, support, support to Ukraine? No, so that wouldn't include support because that would because that's all the reserve funding that comes yeah. in. That's how you. That's no, how you I'm try to. Helpful, trying to get a clear picture. You know I, mean? so it, it, I think the point is just that the main estimate figures tend to relate to core spending as agreed in the spending review. They don't agree an uplift for Ukraine. They don't agree additional funding uh, allocated to the department in the uh, autumn statement in 2022. Yeah in the spring statement in 2023. Yeah. So it is a baseline that the Treasury use, but when you're comparing year-on-year -year growth, outturn to plans plus planned for supplementaries is, is the best measure. And that's the Much of that, that comes shows. from the contingency reserve, which has always been accounted for differently. You know as well as I do, this is all deliberate smoke and mirrors, David. No, it's not deliberate smoke and mirrors, because the it claim from the is. reserve comes through the defence uh, budget in the end. Uh, and is reported in our annual report and accounts. It's audited by the NAO. It, it's, the, it's the authoritative figure on what we have spent. It is, but the problem is with that, though, uh, and it's interesting, when I was in the department, it was one of the things the Conservatives always said, you should take out, for example, the expenditure on Afghanistan and uh, mm. Iraq. Uh, so we're now saying that we shouldn't have done that or we shouldn't uh, so the arguments that Mr Shapps and others were making at the time was wrong well, uh, <laughs> look I, I just think um, uh, if, if, if the argument is uh, should we spend more on defence this government agrees we're committed to 2.5 percent not all yeah, sides I'm, of the well, house well, well, agree I, with can that can I stop you there we're going to get on to that later on uh, okay but I mean and, it's, and, it's and, within uh, this well, context well, hang on we'll get on to that later on but other people have got questions on that so I don't really want to eat their sandwiches yeah. mm -hmm. Do we need to, and I know you're very good at flannel and uh, 
making you know, the positive statements, but what we need to do is do with the detail. And it's important as a committee, and I think for the public as well, they get an understanding in terms of the actual figures rather than, rather well, of course, than, what, so, rather than what you put in a tweet, for so, example. Well, just to be fair, though, um, you can't take the outturn of 23-24 uh, and somehow include supplementaries and then compare it with the projection for 24, 25, and not include supplements, because that's then you not being consistent. No, well, well, I am and all I'm doing well, is being well, consistent. Well, 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 well I, you know. you're not being consistent at all. I was trying to be fair to try and get... Uh, well, well, uh, sorry, I was trying to be fair with you to try and get an understanding so people are, so we can actually get to the bottom of it what the claim is. And I think, fair to David, he's, he's gone through that in terms of explaining how the actual outturns come around, which is fine. Uh, which those figures that uh, Mr. Whitman just just outlined. That's fine. I have a better understanding of what you're, you're suggesting now. Mark, do you want to come in? I'll yes, please. Look, look for, for, for people that are watching, and we're talking about estimates and outturns and supplementary estimates, so let's just go right back to the basics. This is the budget red book. This is the document that gives the detail, the small print, if you like, <coughs> after a budget. And it lists the revenue spending for each of the departments, their limits, known as RDEL, and their capital spending limits, known as CDEL. So, and it lists each department. So if you look at the RDEL list, which is table 2.1 on page 25 of the report, take a comparison with education. So the education budget for 2023-24 is 81.9 billion and then for 2425 it's 84.9 billion so it's gone up 3 billion pounds so far so straightforward when you do the same for the MOD budget the core budget it goes from 35 billion in 2324 to 32.8 billion in 24-25, so the financial year that is just about to start. So that's a cut of £2.2 billion in the core defence budget. Now, when you do that for capital, it goes from 19.2 in 23-24 to 18.9 in 24-25. So that's another 0.3 billion, 300 million off. So when you add the two, that's two and a half billion pounds. Now, I'm not a qualified accountant, but I was a shadow treasury minister under Osborne for three years in opposition, so I learned to read this document by application. The amount we're giving to Ukraine next year is 2.5 billion. So it's almost exactly the same as the cut in next year's core defense budget. So what you tried to do, and that is always traditionally paid for out of the contingency reserve, just as we did with the Falklands War and most other conflicts. It's always been the way. So if you compare apples and apples, that 2.5 billion that goes to Ukraine is not part of the UK defence budget because you can't spend the same pound twice. So if you're spending it on shells for the Ukrainians, money well spent, you can't spend it on army salaries or on submarine maintenance or on new runways for the Air Force. So what you've done is you've suffered a massive defeat at the hands of the Treasury. You've had your budget cut by £2.5 billion and you're now trying to play smoke and mirrors with the Ukrainian money to pretend that your budget hasn't been cut when it's been slashed. Aren't you, Secretary of State? No. no. You uh, absolutely are. Well, let, if, if, let me answer. Let me um, I, I disagree. Uh, and actually, the, the problem with the numbers you've written out is they are read out as they are in themselves misleading because the previous... They're in the, they're in the budget know, but if you it's the me... Now, hang on. It's the official document of the government. OK. However, uh, if you give me a moment here, the... the and and you, by the way, you and I start from the same place. We both want to spend more on yeah. uh, defence. This government's committed to spending more on defence, and, and I absolutely uh, agree. The government is committed to 2.5% as conditions allow. Other parties are only committed to 2%, so they certainly are. Really but but nonetheless, um, the, the reason why those numbers uh, come out as misleading is simply because 
the previous year's figure you read includes the supplemental. The next year you're reading doesn't include the supplemental. And the argument is simple. You either have to include it entirely or you don't include it entirely, as Mr. Jones was uh, offering up previously. You can't include it on one and then not include it on the other. If you do, then the 2024 figure, uh, which you um, presented, um, which was, I think, in your terms, 35 billion, or if I look at the total TDEL, 54.2 billion, in the, sorry, the 23 figure, uh, goes down as well. Uh, so uh, you'd be arguing that the defence budget was reducing every uh, year, including into the past years as well. The only way to look at this is as the NEO looks at it in the audited accounts, which is it does end up including supplementals, which isn't just the two and a half billion, though the number, as you've pointed out, would conveniently well, well, Secretary, suggest. Yeah. It's also well, Secretary, Nord, it's also stock miles, State, if, if you want it's also to, other operations. If you want to draw in the NAO in evidence... In their equipment plan report, recently reported on by the PAC, you've got a black hole over the equipment plan of 29 billion pounds. Again, misleading, so, because... Well, the, oh, well, so the NAO and the PAC yes, are wrong as well? It, it's misleading, and the reason is this. That equipment plan is £288.6 billion pounds over a 10-year period, of which only 25% of it is committed, and it assumes, <coughs> when the NAO looks at it, that we don't get to our 2.5% stated public... Uh, position oh, of uh, defence expenditure, just, just, no, hang on a which yeah, yeah, this yeah, government Mark, says it's committed to. Yeah, yeah, I, I did. Secretary of State, everyone can see what you've done. You've been defeated by the Treasury. You are slap bang guilty of Enron accounting, and you're trying to blow smoke in everybody's eyes by using the Ukrainian money and pretending it's you part of the UK. Hang on of the UK defence budget, it's not. It's part of the Ukrainian... Mr Francois, budget. you're doing exactly the same. You are using Ukrainian money from last year and including it in the budget and then saying, but you can't include it in this year's budget no, but, and then no, coming to misleading conclusions. No, because normally the Red Book... This, these are what an accountant would call accounting adjustments. So you've got a total and then there are some differences to the total and you record why the two numbers are different, Right. The Red Book barely mentions defence at all. We have a Chancellor that has no interest in defence. We all know that. Why, then, aren't these supplementals footnoted in the Red Book? Why aren't last year's supplementals footnoted in the Red Book? I, if you, I join you on the campaign to have those footnoted, but it cannot be right to claim the inclusion of other expenditure, including the supplementals for a range of different issues, in one year, and then look forward and say, but we're not going to include them, unless you think that we're not going to make those contributions, for example, to Ukraine or Dreadnought or other operations or the stockpiles, all of which are already declared. And in defence of the Chancellor, he has spoken himself about 4% in the past. Yes. So I don't think he has no interest in defence. Well, in simple pub English, you're cheating. No, I think it's the other way around. No. I'm sorry. I, I, I want to push no. back very, very strongly, but respectfully. Well, well, well I feel very, very strongly. Because you are deliberately quoting figures, including supplementals, and then not comparing apples with apples when we look at this year. Yeah, I, I, I think we either have to do I both so. or neither. Yeah. So, I think we should now draw a line on this debate, because we've, but I think it illustrates one particular point, which is that we've discussed for eight minutes what the historic numbers are that you've presented there's something wrong in the formulation that we should have this length of debate. And, and given that the, uh, the message that we need to send to adversaries is one of confidence in the funding streams you're getting and all the rest, we clearly need to do better in terms of uh, presenting uh, the, uh, the numbers that you are uh, receiving. Just a couple of questions. I mean, the, the numbers that uh, Ms. Woodman presented on TDEL, mm -hmm. that would suggest a, a, a fall in, in, in real terms, yep. mm. I would just to leave that with you and the other major question is what matters is what you can plan for in terms of your budgeting and so supplementals are great depending on where they come during the course of the year and whether you can actually then apply them to what you can actually budget for so I think maybe you could write back to us as to the, the thought process when you know and this has already been announced and they are subsequent to the spending round, and I appreciate that, absolutely appreciate that point. But in terms of when you are doing your planning, uh, knowing that you have that money uh, guaranteed with the Treasury, you're going to get it. Parliament's still going to vote it, but it's still, you're going to receive it. So we actually know when you're doing your planning what the forecasts are that you're working under. I think that would be a logical. Yes, Is that, and, uh, like it, it would. And I think that would be, uh, I mean, we can write separately, but I would expect to set that out in our 
estimates memorandum for main estimates. Uh, I know we were, uh, for technical reasons, uh, a little late in sending you the mm. uh, supplementaries this year. Yes. Uh, the estimate memorandum for the <coughs> supplementaries does set out the, the increase to the baseline for 23 24. Yeah. I'm, I'm happy to set out what we are currently planning on in the main estimates uh, 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 memorandum if that's. Yeah. most convenient way, or we can set it out directly. Your principal will be a principal master. Your principal I'm curious that you were late this year. Uh, generally, it was an IT. Generally, it was an IT. Yeah, of course it was. I think, our, oh, I think our... So our concern is what budget do you think you have to spend? And yes. we are all 100% in favour of 2.5. Many would like it to be more on... on uh, not only just 2.5 in terms of percentage, but 2.5 in terms of uh, Ukraine. But clearly, as Ms. Francois says, that's not money that you could be spending necessarily yeah. on uh, the UK. So we're all hugely supportive of it, but we're trying to ensure that we know whether you have got an increasing amount of money into the budget in real terms uh, or not. So we can, we can set that out. And if, if it's some comfort from uh, the Red Book, or at least I think his remarks uh, during the spring statement, uh, the Chancellor said his expectation is that we will be spending 2.3% of GDP in 24-25, which is not the number that's in the red book. And that includes 2.5 billion include for Ukraine. Ukraine, which is 0.1% of GDP. Yeah. yeah. Um, Kevin, then Derek, and then I'll come Yeah, on. it's interesting what the Secretary of State said about the NEO report, because it didn't stop you in 2009, for example, the NEO report, uh, equipment report, which says that uh, if there was a £6 billion black hole in the uh, equipment budget then, uh, 30 billion if uh, it was flat cash for the next 10 years. It didn't stop you as a party and your party arguing there was then a 36 billion pound black hole. So I think it is, I agree, how you actually read NEO reports uh, and not use them like the Conservative Party did in 2010 to uh, put something forward as completely fictitious. But can I just clarify one thing? I mean, can I thank you for your uh, figures there? Cause I think that clarifies it for me. And as the chairman says, it is a cut, isn't it? The TDEL figures. So those, call, those nominal numbers probably are a, cut. a real cut. Yeah, thanks. Right, I, I just, just to follow on, just, just so to maybe to aid Mike, or try and enlighten me on my confusion, given the various figures that have been banded around, just, just so we're clear for the record. Uh, Secretary, are you saying that in real terms, defence spending is going up? As long as you include the supplementals, then this year, uh, in real terms, the uh, spending goes up by 1.8% or 2.6% in nominal terms, 1.8% in, uh, in real terms. Um, and, you know, as I say, it's, for people watching this who are now completely confused, the simple question is, do you include things that came in last year and then were included in the so-called Red Book uh, and then ignore them this year, or do you include them? Once you include them this year... Uh, you end up spending £55.6 billion pounds on defence. Uh, so we're... So what, why do you think that... that, that why, do you think, why do you think the Malcolm yeah, Derek, Malcolm? I think the first... Sorry, if, if uh, Ms Williams wanted to add something in there, just and then that, you come back, Derek. That, that figure is based on us uh, adding in for 24 25 additions to the budget that have already been agreed and announced. It's not us having a punt on what we would quite like to see. Yeah, it's an important point. OK, so, thank you. Uh, if they... Look, the bigger picture, Secretary of State, is getting to that 2.5%. Now, you'll be pleased to hear that I was quoting you to the Prime Minister in the Liaison Committee um, not long ago, uh, and your wise words about the necessity of getting to 2.5% uh, and pre-war, and also, uh, I didn't actually mention your aspirations to go beyond 2.5%, uh, uh, and yet the Prime Minister didn't commit to a time. Uh, and a date uh, for the 2.5% uh, and the uplift. Are you able to, to uh, uh, enlighten us now? I'm certain the Prime Minister would have told you an hour ago if uh, that was going to be um, an announcement for today. Uh, but the government is committed to 2.5%. Um, it is, uh, you know, in my view, as you know from my speech in Lancaster House in, in January, uh, that we are living in a more dangerous world, and I use that post-war to pre-war... A phrase to describe why I think the challenges are greater, and I'm in complete agreement um, that, that you know you, you you have to pay for that defence. Um, so uh, you know exact timing, as we've said all along, is uh, 
uh, a matter for the Chancellor and the government's described it as being as conditions allow. Well, I'm the Secretary of State for Defence. Obviously, I uh, you know, urge for uh, us to move to that position um, as quickly as uh, possible. There will be uh, other opportunities, including an election coming. Other parties are only committed to 2%. The NATO base, that's about a £7 billion a year cut to the current defence spending uh, picture. So 2% is about £7 billion less than we spend at the moment it's per yeah, annum. It's just complete so, spin as usual. Kevin. It is, well, you know. But, I mean, I, I, as I say, the bloke doesn't you know, lie there, 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 there will be choices, they? There will be choices come... Uh, come uh, a uh, you know, parliamentary election um, for um, different views of this. And yeah, but you're we are committed the defense to Kevin, can you go through me, please? Yeah, but you're well, cutting the defence budget now. Well, as we've just heard, it's a 1.8% real uh, increase if you include oh, all of the yes, supplementaries, because you're not including, again... Include the figures that Mr Wimple just said. A, 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 again. Go on those rather than what you spin. Well, I, know well, it's, I know it's a difficult thing for you to do, not to spin things as you actually well, like. Mr. Jones, I, I deal I, with facts. I, I'm um, sorry, but the I facts. Just, I we've, we've, had, we've had a long time on that, and the facts are: once you include the supplementals, yeah. we're spending more this year than we did last year. That is the things fact. that aren't necessarily for core yeah. defence expenditure. Well, I think, so I think we've had enough is. debate on it. So there are many other things we can discuss other than the the numbers. Oh, shit, I said, yeah. I said ten minutes ago that we'd already spent eight minutes on this. We've now spent a quarter of an hour. Um, so no. You can't enlighten us on the on the I can't timing, do that. I but can't you do can say this is an absolute priority for you, um, and I assume that has implications for manifestos and the like. Uh, well, as I say, I'm uh, strongly committed, and as as you pointed out, have um, discussed this well before I was defence um, secretary. So I am very committed to uh, making sure that we defend ourselves. And when you do, I think you make a very good case to your adversaries not to try it on. Uh, so I think it's actually cheaper in the long run to do that as well. And I'm very pleased that we're committed to doing it. Of course, I urge uh, uh, you know, us to do that as, as quickly as possible. There's a general election uh, coming up. Eric, do you want to... Number three? Uh, four-ish. Yeah. Four-ish number four, yeah. Yeah. Four-ish. Um, yeah, so I'm completely lost with all the questions. Uh, can, can I... Can I can I just, in terms, if we talk about the facts, can we just come back to the budget earlier this month? Is it a fact that there was no additional money for defence? This budget didn't announce additional lines right. of expense, right. but because there's already been supplementals, no, no, including no, 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 Ukraine question. and Dreadnought, so, 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 the money so, so, still went up. So, so, that's you, correct. You refer to the facts, so it's correct that there's no additional yes. money. Right. Yeah. So given that you, and you're, in fact, even yesterday on the, on the floor of the House, that ministers are now saying we're in a, a pre-war situation, what is it you believe convinced the Chancellor and the Prime Minister not to put any additional money in to the budget for defence, given we're in a pre-war situation? So the, the, although there was no announcement specific in the budget, as, as I was just saying, there was already money that had been pledged, so a couple of months earlier, uh, for example, uh, an increase in uh, defence spending in Ukraine. Now, I hear what the committee said, that's not core defence spending, I hear some people say. Uh, nonetheless, actually, there is, a, there is a war on in Europe, and frankly, I don't really care whether the money comes in oh, okay. so as a supplemental so, 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 or... So do you agree with the decision of the Chancellor and Prime Minister not to put additional money... Look, I, I, uh, look I'm Secretary yes, of State... I'm asking you a simple question. Okay. I'm Secretary of State for Defence. Yeah, I have been I've been yeah. Secretary of State in many different departments, yeah. and by the way, always pretty successful in getting the money into whether it's energy or transport infrastructure, yeah. what have you. I intend to be successful you agree in, with the Prime in Minister this role Chancellor. as well. I also have collective responsibility, and that, and that means that you know, this is a whole government budget. I'm very pleased. I actually <coughs> am you, the... Did you uh, make representations for additional money to the Chancellor? Well, I think it's widely known that, I, that, that, of course, I uh, made representations. So you don't what agree? kind of Secretary of State would You don't agree with the Chancellor and Prime Minister, then? Because I'm Secretary of State for Defence, I think that it should be a priority, of course. So, so you made representations for additional money. The yes. Chancellor and the Prime Minister rejected that. Saying that they'd already put more money in, but, but, and that's revealed in but, the 1.8%. So more. why did you ask for more money then? Because, of course, every Secretary of State's job is to lobby for their why area. Why specifically did you ask for more money? Because uh, every Secretary of State wants to get more money. What's the reason you ask for more money? Well, there are any number of things that well, I'd like to spend the, 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 the money on. Uh, like the committee. What I was like. it in defence that you needed extra money for? Well, I can go through a uh, you know, well, long we, list. We, there's, we, there's, almost, yeah. there's almost no programme that I wouldn't want to enhance. Well, let's, let's take improve. the top one, one, one two or three programmes. Uh, it, it's hard to get, give you a sort of exact list, but uh, there's n almost nothing what that is, I wouldn't want to do. What specifically worried you that you needed to ask for extra money? Because we are committed to going to 2.5%. I wanted to put forward the argument. The question I'm asking. That, I know, but you're not even letting me answer a question. You're before answering you. it. 
I'll try if you let me. I'll, I'll be back okay. for a minute. We're committed to going to 2.5%. Yeah, of course, the Secretary of State for Defence. I argue that we should do that yeah, as soon as possible. Uh, in sec as Secretary of State in many different departments now, I have always argued, and often successfully, you don't win that every single time. The view of the government on this occasion was that there's already more money due to come to defence. Indeed, uh, although uh, it's in a supplemental, we'd already increased an in uh, announced an increase uh, on the Ukraine spending. If that had been done in the budget, you would have probably have been telling me there had been an increase. So it's a question partly of, of timing, but there are many different fiscal events, and the trajectory is in the right direction. I think the general government wants to come in just before that. So what is it that made you feel we've got to get to 2.5 now? I made speeches so about this. The Prime Minister didn't agree with you. Well, look, I, I've, I've made speeches about this. I believe that rather than going back to 2%, which is your party's policy, we should go up to 2.5%. We've, we've established that you and the Prime Minister the Chancellor agree. 2% NATO. Ooh. No, no, no it's not. But, it's not. Yeah, Chair, in, in fairness, that is not the situation. But yeah. let's, go, let's stick, to, let's stick to the government and their position. So basically, we, we have agreed that you asked for additional money, the Prime Minister and the Chancellor rejected it. Uh, so, therefore, you don't agree with the decision of the Prime Minister and Chancellor. Well, I agree. What they, not putting money in the budget. Well, so, I, General, General, you wanted to come in. Oh, hold on. No, did you, no, you put well, a point to me which I don't agree with. I agree with collective well, responsibility, right? So, of course, every Secretary of State bids for more money. You don't always get that money. And then to sort of turn that round and say, oh, therefore, you don't agree with the overall budget, uh, d d defies the point of collective so responsibility. So, what, by, by not getting to 2.5 now, or, or in fact 3%, what does that mean we... Um, what, what does that mean in terms of uh, defence? What does that cause us a problem with? Well, right now, the good news is that we're able to cover all of our NATO operations and do everything that I've ever wanted to do since I've come in. For example, sending troops to Kosovo, being active in the Red Sea, Even providing increased support to uh, Ukraine, all of which I've done because I, including Ukraine, because I have got a bit more money, although I know it's seems to be resistant to, to accepting that the, you know, uh, when we look at the, the, the National Audit Office will agree with me at the end of the year that we spent more money, which will, if we can come we, back we in a year's money, time, we can demonstrate your point. But General, you wanted to come in. Sorry, well, yeah, just Mr. Twig, Twig, Twig we've, I think we're on record in this committee declaring the sorts of things in, in addition to the programme of record that we wish to invest in. Yeah. So asking the Secretary to say, I think we've already answered that. We've discussed the sorts of things from go through the again. Go with the, did you go with the, uh, the Secretary of State to the Prime Minister asking for these? Exactly as the Secretary of State has said. Right, we said okay. we want, we want uh, additional resource. If we want to mitigate this level of operational risk, yeah. Uh, then, then we would need more resource in these areas, and we can go through those areas again. Yeah. Um, just give us a quick, 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 a quick few seconds, just so we get on the record again. What, what we've been very are. clear that the money, the amount of money we're spending on munitions uh, at the moment, yeah, we've got uh, which is one, significant, yeah. is, yeah. It does, does not meet um, uh, in all areas the threats that we that we okay. face. Uh, we've been clear that we need to spend uh, more money above the programme of record on what we call integrated air missile defence. Yep. Uh, I, I could go on. Uh, you know, we, but we've, we've okay. said these things before. Good. You, so and, just and to say that we have record. made it clear if we were given additional money, uh, what we would spend it money on. But we, we work within the money we've got and we, and we carry the operational risk accordingly. And that's what we're doing in 24-25. Yeah. Against the budget, the operational risk is at a certain you level. You clearly felt it important enough to go and ask for this additional money for those, for those reasons. OK, thank you, Chair. Yeah. Thank you, Derek. Thank you, John. Now, you want to come in very quickly, Martin, before we thank go you. to Gavin. Yep. Uh, Secretary State, uh, let's go back to the Public Accounts Committee's report, where the... Right Honourable Member, for, I believe for Hackney South and Shoreditch, stated in the opening remarks, in an increasingly volatile world, the Ministry of Defence's lack of credible plan to deliver fully funded military capability, as desired by government, leaves us in an alarming place. But this problem is not new. Year on year, our committee, year has, seen year, budget, our committee sorry, has seen budget... Sorry. That's what happens when you do technology. Year on year, our committee has seen budget overruns and delays in defence procurement. A lack of discipline in the MOD's budgeting and approach has led to an inconsistent plan that just isn't a reliable overview of the equipment programme's affordability. Do you recognise anything of any truth in the Chair's comments in that opening remark? They're all wrong. I think um, it would be disingenuous to sort of claim that uh, procurement has been a consistent triumph in defence <coughs> over many decades. And uh, it's one of the reasons why, and you'll recall when I, perhaps my last appearance or the one before, when I was first became um, a defence secretary, I agreed that we should have a new uh, system of procurement called the Integrated Procurement let, let uh, just... Plan and, and indeed offered your committee the opportunity to be part of creating that. And that's something that we launched last month in response to 
precisely those concerns. Let me briefly I'll then just... question first. You, you done, Secretary State? Yep. Yeah, just to briefly, because I know that the Chair wants to bring others in, just in terms of the procurement and the whole processes through the Ministry, the report does then go on to say, and we will disagree, for example, on the nuclear deterrent, but our role today is to hold power to account in terms of how it manages that yeah, money. So in terms of the nuclear budget for the coming decade, it's stated it's jumping from $38.2 billion in one year to more than $109 billion. Uh, how does that then impact any additional spending on your conventional force if you have inflationary and also the issues around currency movements? Uh, yeah, so the, the principal uh, increase in the cost of the programme is linked to the deterrent, uh, as you say, uh, and that's uh, as a result of us really doing a drains-up review uh, of uh, what we needed to ensure that we went through a decade of major uh, recapitalisation with appropriate uh, contingency and funding to make sure that we could deliver uh, those uh, critical programmes. The central budget assumption uh, that we used, uh, and I think I was going to explain to the uh, Public Accounts Committee at, at the time. In terms of uh, formal uh, budgets, I have good confidence, including the supplementaries, uh, for 24-25, uh, but then we are into a spending review, uh, so uh, the, you know, uh, the issues will be uh, decided through that process, and indeed over a 10-year horizon, there's always uh, more than one spending review to go. The central budget assumption that we've used assumes that the nuclear programme uh, is funded to uh, a line that we've discussed and agreed uh, with Treasury colleagues uh, and that Treasury assumptions about how the uh, rest of the budget might grow are there for uh, conventional capabilities. But that central assumption doesn't, as the Secretary of State has already uh, said, uh, plot a trajectory towards 2.5%, which is the uh, government's position. Just finally, Chair, there is a rather insane rumour going around at the moment that we've been hearing about today, that with the unarmed, unarmed Trident missile misfire earlier, I think it was it last month, that a member of the Cabinet may actually have been involved in the firing of the, that missile. What? Now, I'm wondering, Chair... I can absolutely, although we don't I'm discuss... Although, although, we don't discuss although we don't discuss national security issues, I can absolutely guarantee... That no member sure of the government was involved untrue. in that. Thank you. I settled that one? Yeah. Good. Um, it's not one I've heard either, I should say. <laughs> <laughs> you learn something new every time you come to the committee, Secretary State. Um, Gavin, on to, we're now on to military capability. Thank you very much, uh, Chair, and I do think, Secretary State, good afternoon to you. Um, that There is some overlap in the questions that you've faced up until now, but I hope at the outset you would accept that across all of the parties represented around this table, none of them present an electoral threat to me in Northern Ireland, and therefore I will not be electioneering in, in my questions. But I hope you would also accept that it isn't sufficient to simply outline that because you're the Secretary of State for Defence, <clears throat> you just naturally ask for more. You always want more. That for a Member of Parliament like me and colleagues around the table, the imperative is actually about defending our national <coughs> sovereignty, our national defence, our readiness, our ability to respond to threats and prepare appropriately for them. So not in the abstract, hopefully you'll accept. Not in the abstract, just because you're Secretary of State, you ask for more, but actually yes. you should be asking specifically and purposefully for the capacity and capability that we require to defend our nation. I agree entirely. Thank you. Um, and you were asked to give an example of the sort of things you were seeking additional funds for, but you haven't done so. Do you wish to give a, an example of those now, over and above what the General said? Um, because I think it's important from, from a national perspective that you as the Secretary of State for Defence have the opportunity to indicate where you do think there are financial frailties within your department and what capacities you do require and that we require as a country for the future. Well, a number have been mentioned. Uh, the, the reality is that there are a vast range of different things and future weapons that I would like to spend more uh, time on and, and inevitably, in the end, more money. I mean, it's always been thought... Through the decades, we fought with three different services, land, air, and sea. Uh, but now we increasingly do much more in cyber and a huge amount more uh, required also in space. So we've got more domains that we're fighting, the, so there'll be expansions there. We've talked about the replenishment because of our uh, generosity and our gifting to 
um, Ukraine. And this is a question of how much risk you want to carry at any one moment in time. Uh, and it sits both within defence, um, because, uh, as you rightly say, it's the first task and job of any government to defend the nation. And by the way, as the country who has the second largest NATO budget, with a blip for Germany at the moment because they've got a sum of money going through, but it's not in their baseline core at all. Uh, we, we do pull our weight when it comes to uh, the NATO contribution. Um, but, you know, I want to I, I build systems which keep us safe for the future and in particular deter our enemies from trying it on. And I think, uh, you know, for all of those reasons, uh, I, I, you know, I, I can see where we'd spend money. But I would say... I hope with the agreement of this committee, it's not just about how much money you have, 55.6 billion this year, it's about how you spend the money. And that's why the integrated uh, procurement model, the new plan to actually spend money in a much better way, I think is incredibly important. And lastly, and here we have been able to do things, I think the nature of warfare is shifting and changing, even in the six months that I've been in this job, even in that time. In my visits to Ukraine, I'm seeing on the front line in actual war situations assumptions which would never have been the case six months ago, for example, Ukraine sinking uh, large amounts of the Black Sea fleet without themselves having a navy is changing the way that we look at warfare as well. So drones, um, uh, sea and air, th those are all ish areas where uh, you know, I think there's a lot more room for um, new thinking and defence. Yeah, but you'll also accept that sometimes we are faced with choices, you're faced with a choice that is constrained by an earlier decision made in different circumstances. So as a Member of Parliament for East Belfast where N-laws are made, for example, we saw their incredible utility in the early months of 2022 and the renewed interest in that system, but recognised that through UK defence it was discontinued 10 years ago. Yeah, and we've seen lots of weapons that aren't new. I mean, the, the Storm Shadow is another example, like the N-Law, which is actually not a particularly modern missile, but has been incredibly effective. Uh, but there are new generations of, of uh, missiles and others coming along all the so, time. So what opportunity have you as Defence Secretary taken then to reappraise decisions that were made prior to your appointment as mm. Defence Secretary, which in light of Ukraine and an invasion, full invasion of a country within... Uh, our European territory. Uh, have you really? Well, yeah, very. To say I mean, I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples. Yeah. Any, any navy uh, which was thinking as it was a year ago um, uh, about both its own defence, as we've seen in the Red Sea, and also uh, its own attack, uh, isn't thinking about the consequences of what's happened, both actually in the Red Sea and also in the Black Sea, where uh, we've seen uh, an asymmetric level of uh, warfare in both ways. So in the Black Sea, with regard to um, drones at sea, and in, uh, in the Red Sea, drones in air, and the asymmetric nature of either sinking a Russian uh, warship or uh, firing expensive missiles yeah. like Sea Vipers uh, at inexpensive drones, uh, you're saying it's seeing an asymmetry, which should make us all think about the way that we're doing things. And I, I recently um, highlighted the work of DSTL with the Dragonfire, for example, uh, which has the potential for you know, £10 a shot to, for example, take down a, a, a drone. So how fast can we bring these things forward? What's the, what's the progress? So, so those are the types of differences in, the, in, in, in thinking that are going on right now. Mr Williams <laughs> mentioned in his last answer that there is a forthcoming spending review and we know that in 2021 there was a spending review that led to uh, the reduction in scale or the cancellation of a significant number of programmes 2021 in advance of Ukraine's invasion, in advance of resurgent Russia, in advance of threats from China um, and you know that the consequences, we got a list of uh, the decisions taken from 2021 just last week. Um, that included the cancellation of the warrior infantry uh, vehicles. That included the reduction of E7 aircraft um, from five to three platforms. And knowing what training and maintenance and so on is required, that's really very few for utility purposes. Have you looked at those decisions from 2021 and gone through them to see where the assumptions prior to the invasion of a sovereign country in Europe right 
So I do think, they sustain today? So, so uh, first of all, I mean, every every department has to cut its cloth at some point and live with it before. 21 obviously was well before my time. What's interesting when I do look through those programmes, there's quite a lot of things which you look at today and say, actually, I'm not sure that would be the right programme to pursue. And as I say, only in the last couple of years during the war and even the last six months, there'd be a whole batch of new things that you would want to do. So we have turned on new programmes in areas, uh, not, not all of which can be discussed in this forum, but nonetheless, areas where um, there certainly there wasn't even an industry related to it um, going back a year or two. Um, so, so I think that that list would inevitably quite be quite different. So, so if the list would be quite right. well, if, if if the list would be quite different, chair, then in what way? What is it that will be resurrected from mm. the council state? Uh, or I was going to say, why don't we? Why don't, a bit of expertise for someone who's actually General, here. Um, again, we want to no, say, uh, actually, I wasn't there. Uh, I wasn't there at the time. Um, but the I mean, the list I sent you is the down arrows uh, from SR twenty one. But it was a set of down arrows in order to create financial headroom alongside substantial increased investment uh, in defence for, for the investment. It's cancellation of, you know, of cancellations plans. and yeah, yeah and deferrals. Yeah. No, I get that. Yeah. But it was uh, a set of decisions to retire capabilities, many of which were coming towards the end of their uh, service life, in order to create, with the additional investment in defence, uh, headroom for investment in future uh, capabilities. And that was a deliberate risk judgment. Uh, taking the time about uh, uh, securing the future uh, and taking risk in the in the short term. Now, with the invasion of Ukraine, uh, the uh, risk you're willing to take in the short term and when you want that future uh, to arrive uh, is a live question uh, that we have been working through in our plans uh, and is reflected uh, in part in the snapshot in the uh, equipment plan from last year, uh, but as the Secretary of State says, the, both the pace of technological change uh, and the evolution of capability that we're seeing uh, on the battlefield in Ukraine means that rather, I think, than reprieving <coughs> savings that we made in 21, if there were more money available, we will want to invest in new capabilities that are uh, appropriate to the way in which we want to fight in the future. Chair, yeah, I recognise you've got time constraints, but I think some of the answers will require further exploration at a future date because reducing aerial surveillance, reducing the platforms, retiring the E3, changing the availability of investment in joint air-to-ground missiles and all the rest of it seems to jar quite considerably with the requirements that are acknowledged. And then. Well, um, I, I want to try and reassure the committee. First of all, um, we, we're absolutely observing as everyone is, uh, what's going on in Ukraine, um, and we are applying the lessons of Ukraine, but we're not going to over-apply the lessons of Ukraine. NATO is not fighting in Ukraine, um, and so NATO will fight in a different way because of a whole range of circumstances. Having said that, it's very easy uh, to have a conversation about capability and say, well, we should have not deleted this then because we need it now, but we're having a more fundamental review for the Secretary of State over the next six months. And that's about how are we going to fight in the future and how are we going to structure ourselves to fight in the future. Mm. And because of that, and we're going to fight and deter in a very different way than we have before because of the lessons we're learning from Ukraine and other areas, that will lead us to, very quickly, through this summer into a, into a review next year of a range of capability choices associated with how we're going to fight and how we're going to structure. But I think it's too binary to just go down a list of kit to determine what we what do or don't need. It may be, and we shall see where the review goes, mm -hmm. but I would make the point that you are not the first individual in such a uniform, in such mm -hmm. a seat in this committee, to talk to us about a fundamental review, cycle after cycle, year after year, new ways of doing more with less, relying on allies and losing sovereign capability, and what happens? Defence never wins. This is different because we've got a war in Europe it's always different. since 1945, always a war in Europe, and we, have, we are shifting from a posture uh, of, of uh, campaigning, operating in, in certain regions of the world, to moving to a deterring war-fighting posture. In my career, that is, a that is the most fundamental change in my career.
Yes, and and I've been on, this, I've I've been on this committee for, for eight years, Chair, and we've seen five substantive reviews within Defence, yep. and on each and every occasion, the ability for our MOD and our services to respond to threats, their capacity, their size and their scale is reduced. Well, we'll see. Well, can I just say that, if we're also being, Gavin's put one side of the, of the coin, the other side may well be that the Department is has read thoroughly our report on uh, readiness for war. Uh, the, logic, the logic of that would be working out how mm. we're fighting in these scenarios, learning the lessons from uh, Ukraine. And I thought Ms Williams's point, um, in terms of the timing, that maybe in a pre-Ukraine environment, one would take a longer time frame to get uh, state-of-the-art technology in, and perhaps one has to take decisions on timing, is also another interesting theme for us to pick up on. So two very interesting points that I think have come out of that uh, of that discussion for us to pick up on. Um, on Ukraine, uh, Richard, I think you're going to uh, take a thought about Kit. I am. Good afternoon to you all. Um, Secretary of State, do you agree that um, Ukraine cannot fall? Yes. Do you think, and the UK is leading and has led with equipment and help, and we should be proud of that, do you think that the West is doing sufficient to give Ukraine enough armour and so forth to keep the Russians at bay and one day take their country back? I think it's insufficient. Is there more that we could do, for example, a vehicle that uh, I'm very familiar with, and others probably are too, the Warrior vehicle, which is being retired, hundreds of which have already been retired. We have 625, I understand. Has there been any consideration to give some of those to Ukraine? Yeah. I, I, look, I, to give a slightly longer version, I, I do think that we need to do more. I think it's unthinkable that we uh, would lose this war to uh, Putin. I think we easily have the facility and capability uh, not to lose this uh, war, but it requires everyone to lean their shoulders into it. And I was in Ukraine a couple of weeks ago um, having this, exactly this conversation with Zelensky. I think that um, the catastrophic outcome of losing the war would be far more expensive than uh, ensuring that Ukraine exactly. is in a position to win it. Mm -hmm. So I am um, with... That frame in mind, uh, again, looking through all of our uh, stocks, including things which could be retired. Now, two years on, things are, you know, things have moved on again to have another scrub through the inventory. But more to the point, because we have been incredibly generous in our gifting, mm -hmm. I'm also working on and with, or with and on, I would say, our uh, partners, of which there are 52 countries in the Ukraine defence contract contact group uh, to make sure that they are also um, really digging deep to ensure that they uh, assist. And so I look at, for example, uh, our contribution in all things, including areas like uh, long-range missiles, for example, uh, but in many other areas as well, to make sure that uh, we aren't an outlier uh, whilst others aren't giving as much. And those things are very important. We're playing our part, Secretary of State, there's no doubt. But if they're going to win this war, they, there's no doubt that they need an awful lot more kit. Yes. Billions of dollars worth of support is stuck in America. Yeah. Can you update the committee on where that is, and is it going to be forthcoming soon? Anyone who can second-guess Congress in that manner, um, uh, it, it would be a good person to have address you, and it's but not, it's, it's not me, but I... I'm assuming, sorry to interrupt you, yeah. I'm assuming you ring your opposite number and say, come yes. on, this is absolutely crucial. Yes. Because as you said, the cost of protecting the eastern border, yep. if Ukraine falls, would amount to hundreds of billions yep. a year. My, my opposite number would entirely agree, uh, Lloyd Austin. Uh, would agree with that. Um, it's stuck in Congress um, and, and specifically in the House and for all manner of complicated internal reasons hasn't come out the other side and I think it uh, is therefore prudent for the rest of the world and I don't just mean the West here because for example I was in Australia last week and they feel very much the same way because they would understand the read across from a loss to Putin would be that an autocrat elsewhere in the world uh, might think of taking other territories. So this is um, of the 52 countries in the Ukraine 
uh, contact group, defence contact group. One is the United States. That still leaves 51 of us. And uh, I think that the UK is in a natural place to uh, show leadership in order to make sure that the coalition of the willing, uh, which includes the US as an administration, but not as a Congress at the moment. How many of those 51, Seven. Secretary, are actually willing? There's a lot of talk. Yeah. Not necessarily a lot of action. How often do you meet, perhaps, virtually? It's sort of months. Say, what does Ukraine need? They need this, this, for heaven's sake, give it to them. It's, it's a monthly meeting of the UG, uh, UDGC. And Every it, month that passes, thousands more die. Well, I mean, this, they're this, desperately this, short of shells, armoured vehicles. Yeah, and I mean that's the, that's the manpower. That's a, they? that's at the defence level, um, d- defence secretary level. But below that, in, in other forums, for example, Jeff, the Joint Expeditionary Force, where I had a meeting with them the week before last about what more we can be doing to support Ukraine and how we can integrate them uh, more into our work, uh, which is uh, work in progress. So there are many, many different ways. And the picture, just for the committee's interest, is not a straightforward one. There are huge challenges on the Eastern Front, as the committee will know, uh, and that is a matter of making sure that Western uh, munitions in particular uh, get through. Um, But in the Black Sea, uh, almost the opposite is the case. Six months ago, uh, the Black Sea fleet sailed freely around the Black Sea. Putin had pulled out of the uh, Black Sea grain initiative and there was nothing being exported. Six months later, not a single Russian Black Sea fleet ship is sailing at sea in the Black Sea, which is an extraordinary outcome, with Ukraine now okay. exporting the nearly as much still, as they did back in uh, it, before the war. The Russians are still making progress, albeit very slow. Well, they're, 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 my point is they're making progress in one area and falling back in another area, is my point. Yes, but you don't actually need a ship to take land. That's The infantry do that, as you well know. So the fact that ships are holed up is very good news, I accept, but the Russian troops are still advancing into... There's a slightly wider point I'm making, which is that it has enabled uh, Ukraine, and particularly Deputy Prime Minister Kubikov, to get exports going again at a level which is helping them to fund their own economy and helping to fund weapons. So there's a, there's a broader point to that. Thank you. Thank you, um, Jesse. Thank you very much, and thank you, Secretary of State. You said something I thought was very significant, which is... Um, th- there is no way we can lose this, law, this war to Putin. There's no way we can lose this war to Putin. And saying there is no way we can lose this war to Putin, I think absolutely rightly aligns directly our interest as a country and as part of Europe with what the Ukrainians are doing. And, of course, it underlines a further point you made, which is that there's a connectivity between each of these conflicts because resolution, resolve, effectiveness are all being calibrated and measured across the different theatres of war, and therefore there's a tremendous signalling effect if we fall short in one and others, our adversaries, can take, can take comfort, possibly wrongly, from signalling. That's, that's why the budget issue we had earlier is so important. Now, um, this is really a, a... I suppose this is a question for, for David Williams more than for you, Secretary of State, but you must come in if you want, which is, look, given that... Mr. Wiffman's already said that the core planning budget has fallen in real terms, although the top-up supplementary budget has grown in real terms. Has your planning capability, which has been highlighted by Mr. Robinson, deficiencies in the potential deficiencies of the past, has that planning capability been affected by the real terms reduction in funding? Well... (laughs) Because that's your planning budget, right? That's your core budget. Okay, but without wanting to get back to the first 18 minutes of the hearing, um, uh, when you add in the announcements that the government has made through various fiscal events, then... We know this, but that's not the core planning budget. I'm I'm asking you, sorry, I I don't want to get back to this, but has the core planning budget reduction affected your ability to do core planning? No. That's all I wanted to ask. Thank you. Um, Is the uh, fundamental review that... General McGowan mentioned, going to be something that takes account of the five previous reviews that we were have had mentioned and discussed in this conversation and learn the lessons on how it can be effective as a piece of internal negotiation as well as a process of 
deep reflection on our capability. Of course, and, and there are people in the department that have got that, uh, that, that knowledge as well, and we will pull on that and all those, those reviews to ensure that we do learn the lessons that Mr Robinson was talking about. But this will be a new review, we hope, um, and, um, and we've got to be, it's got to be uh, set against the current um, strategic context, which is different to, to, to the previous ones. But, of course, we will look at what uh, are the, the mistakes we've made in the past and the, and the successes we've had in the past. The, the, obviously, the, the deep worry is that changes in technology in particular just render some approaches to war overall potentially unviable, if not now, then over a 5 or 10, 15 year planning horizon. Indeed, and, and that, that's why uh, Minister of Defence Procurement, uh, James Cartledge, on the, on the floor of the House when he introduced the integrated procurement model, made it really clear about this so-called spiral uh, development <coughs> uh, which will be inherent in the IPM which is that a certain percentage of the funding for capability X will be set aside to ensure that it can meet exactly what you've just said. Because the battle space in Ukraine is changing by the week, and uh, let, let, let alone every year. And therefore, we, that is one of the key lessons, that we have enough flexibility in our budget. Enough of it is not only uncommitted, but committed in a spiral way to a, to a particular capability to ensure we can keep up with the technological change. So, so part of the effect of that, just to be clear then, is not just that you get much more rapid, as it were, generational turnover in the way that a particular program is being moved forward, but you have a reserve that can act as a resilience pool against future technology change. Is that yes, right? Yes, absolutely that. And, and to be more agile, to be faster, there are a number of uh, ways of doing that. But the crit if I were allowed to say one thing, that is a much, much closer relationship with industry, literally sitting beside industry to ensure they can respond in, 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 in a, an agile way that we need to in the future. That, that's a change. Okay, that's very helpful. Can we just now go to Ukraine? Um, We've already heard discussion about asymmetric war from the Secretary of State. Um, we've heard discussion of drones, air, sea. Can you just highlight what you think the three or four leading technologies have proven to be and where we've been able to support the Ukrainians? Yeah, so I think, without getting too technical here, but we can go as deep as you wish. Um, if I were to say maybe three things off the top of my head, which we're seeing, uh, well, it's not off the top of my head, this is driving the review that we've just been talking about. This so-called, what we're really seeing playing out in Ukraine, and we think will play out in future battle, battlefields, battle spaces, this so-called sensor shooter environment, where you have these sensors forward, and you have a lot more sensors, and they ten tend to be uncrewed sensors. And then you've got the shooters out of the battle space, uh, out of harm's way, uh, protected, that then can prosecute their fires through this forward screen. And that involves a very strong reconnaissance architecture, a very long-range precision fires, but also a command and control architecture to knit that together. So I just focus on that particular one. There are three or four others we could talk about. But that is quite a shift in the way we're going to fight in the future. And we're seeing Ukraine and Russia uh, learning that very fast. Right. And therefore, if we were to contrast it with, as it were, the Bosnia conflict, another war in Europe, that was not, in some sense, an imperialistic war from an adversary we've been fighting directly, at least, in the Cold War. This is that. They're rapidly evolving their forms of warfare. We're doing the same. And the nature of the electronic engagement that's being made is rapidly changing as a result. Yes, but I think Bosnia is quite a useful case in point that we're not going to fight Ukraine again. We're not going to fight Bosnia again. So it's finding the themes, but we're all, we've been, many uh, 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 people are charged with trying to reinvent, re focus on the last war. So the, the clever bit is to identify what are those themes within Ukraine or Bosnia that we take forward to the future and not replicate precisely what's happening, because it won't happen in the same way again. Okay, so, sorry, so, so, so. I was just going to make a, a simple uh, observation and, and projection, which is this is probably the first true drone war. And I don't think we'll ever see a war again which doesn't heavily involve drones. I, 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 by the way, I mean, we might, but not in a planning horizon, not in a generational horizon. I agree. Um, let me ask another, just, just to pick that up, though, and, and then I'll, I'll wind up. Um, when we think about the way in which the theatre is changing the battlefield uh, and the wider strategic challenges changing in Ukraine, um, what are the kinds of trade-offs that you're seeing in your own... Uh, procurement of existing equipment that's need to be, that will need to change in order to be able to shift resources into that 
newly thematic electronic war that you're talking about? We, we've, we've tried to go here before, uh, and it's difficult to have those conversations for a number of reasons. Cl uh, I'm, I've been really clear that we will make those hard choices. We'll have to make those hard choices against the budget that we're given, whatever that is, uh, uh, to ensure that we can meet the drone battle space of the future. But, but what those trade-offs are, I mean, for two reasons. Commercially, it would not be appropriate to say that here. And this is an open uh, environment. Uh, you wouldn't expect me to declare where I'm going to take operational risk in the future. Thank you. <coughs> okay, that's extremely helpful. Thank you very much indeed, Chair. Very interesting to see. Uh, Martin, you were very keen to come in. I think, yes, yeah. Um, great, um, as is Mark, yeah, yeah. and then it's yeah, yeah. Then on to the next. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering, uh, Secretary of State, you know, it's increasingly clear that for the necessity for Ukraine to defend itself against r Russian aggression, it's not necessarily a lack of what do they call it, formidability or the need for modernization or some sense of new technological enterprise. What they require, what they keep telling us, is an old-fashioned triptych of more people, more ammunition and more time. I wonder if you would agree. Uh, half and half, actually, in reality, because, yes, they need a lot more 155 and other calibre uh, of ammunition. Yes, they need more people, they don't have endless supplies of people and their country is not as uh, you know, populous as Russia. Um, but they also need to play the asymmetric advantage. We had that conversation about the Black Sea or the way that drones are being um, used. Um, and actually, drones are interesting in as much as they belie the usual facts of war, which is usually every generation gets more expensive to have lethal effect. Um, but actually, drones, which sometimes cost a few thousand, pounds um, can be extremely lethal and you've, you've seen that being used in this war in a way uh, which you, you know we, we've recently given 325 million for um, drones um, if that were being given for missiles it wouldn't buy a lot of missiles it would be a huge huge number of drones so 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 I think techn technological advantage is part of it but yes basic warfare and munitions and traditional stuff is also incredibly important. But just briefly, I don't want to go into the drones at the moment. I'd be grateful, it'd be good if we had more time for it, but we can't uh, because I know there is a concern around the glider drones specifically, and that there might be an issue that the Russian Federation is getting access to Western technology to help with them. But we can maybe come back to that later. Specifically, in terms of ammunition, I wonder if you can advise a committee around the Czech Republic's artillery shell shortage programme where a substantial number of NATO allies are investing in that programme, uh, which would allow, I think, around about 800,000 identified stockpiles across Africa and Asia. The right? Russian Federation is firing around about 10,000 shells a day. The Ukraine's are only 2,000 return at the moment. Is your department investing in that programme? Yeah, so we, we, have, we work through uh, what's called Kindred, which is our programme to uh, uh, obtain and provide uh, things like muni munitions. Um, so what we're doing actually so is... that specific programme? It's no, because we, we're coordinating to make sure that we don't compete with that programme, but okay. we already provide a lot of munitions through international purchase, doing something very similar. Thank you. Thank you. And Secretary State, to state the obvious, some of the stuff about lowering the cost of lethal uh, munitions clearly has an impact on uh, <coughs> non-state actors and their access to those which we're yes. seeing real time. Uh, Mark, you want to come in? Uh, generally, you, you, a few minutes ago, you announced something really very important, I think. You talked about a review ongoing within the department. Now, just for clarity, I take it you don't mean a complete defence review in the, in the classic model, but a, it, how would you characterise it? Is this, if you like, a, 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 a review of our war fighting capabilities specifically? Is that a yes. fair... Right. It's called the Future Force Design Review. The Future Forces Design Review. Future Force Design Review. Three elements. How we're going to fight, how we will structure ourselves to fight, and what are those capability choices. And that will form the golden thread of the mil military capability advice to the Secretary of State as part of a review if we have one next year. OK, and so in the way of the MOD, that will now be the FFDR. Right. OK, oh. and which, which minister has day-to-day -day charge? It can't be Heapy. He's just resigned on a point of honour over the cuts. So which minister has day-to-day -day responsibility? Well, I talk about it day-to-day -day with Minister for Defence Procurement. So it's, it's Min DP who... Yes. who it has the lead on it. Indeed. Okay, because he buys the kit. Indeed. That's very helpful. Thank you. Great. 
Emma. Thank you very much, Chair. Afternoon, all. Um, even though we were significantly hampered in our recent readiness report by the Department, what we did conclude quite bluntly is that we are not ready for war. Now, we don't have the kit or the personnel to be ready. In November, Secretary of State, you told us that retention and recruitment was an area of concern for you, and yet we are continuing to lose personnel faster than we can recruit them. Have you yet seen the implementation plan for Hawthorne Wait? So uh, I do maintain that this is one of the biggest areas of concern. You're absolutely right to highlight it. Um, I'll perhaps ask others to speak to the specific uh, plan, but what I can tell you is that we are um, seeing a big increase in interest and in applications, which I know is not the end of the story, but uh, just to put it on record, uh, a, a six-year high in the Army uh, in January, and I've just got the February figures, uh, have come through as well, and again, they're at six-year highs. So, uh, Secretary, have you seen the implementation plan? So, the implementation this is a priority for you. You told us. That's right. So have you seen the implementation? So, plan? I've seen the implementation plan being worked up. I'm not yet happy with uh, all elements of it, so we're carrying on working on it. So David just, may want to. Add I was more going to it. ask David a question actually, because David, you told our committee that the plan would be with ministers before Christmas last year. Yeah. So it's taken from Christmas last year for you, Secretary of State, to now say you're not happy with that implementation plan. That's been quite a long time, considering you said this is a concern and it's something you want to look at at pace. So two, two observations, if I may. And then, yeah, no, so, sorry, unless you want to no, go. No, no, go you. Um, so firstly, uh, against the um, immediate uh, pressures around recruitment uh, in particular, um, uh, the Haven for Wait uh, review and the recommendations that that review made are, are relevant, they're part of the answer, uh, but I think they're not uh, sufficient. So uh, one of the things that uh, the Secretary of State has asked uh, and the ministerial team uh, have been getting from the, uh, the people area of the department uh, is a shorter term focused, what are the immediate steps we need to do to uh, uh, recover on, uh, on recruitment? Uh, and there's sort of a 12 uh, or 13 uh, step approach that the team is working on uh, there. Uh, on Haventhwaite, the approach that um, we are taking to implementation is, pilot's really the wrong word, I, I think it's more of an early adopter, uh, to uh, work through 24 on a particular cohort around engineering uh, uh, personnel, that's uh, around 10,000 uh, people in the armed forces, uh, to look at uh, themes from the Haventhwaite review around total reward, uh, around uh, spectrum of service, uh, around the skills framework uh, and to put those recommendations into practice with a specific cohort before broadening, uh, broadening out. Uh, there are some... Yeah, you, David, can I just be clear then? So in terms of the implementation plan, nothing's been implemented yet. So no, the review range... was June 2023. The implementation plan was before Christmas, but nothing yet has been implemented around recruitment and retention from that implementation plan. Uh, no, that's not um, that's not fair. A range of uh, a range of activity is is going on. Can you give us um, an example? The, uh, uh, so, well, we've been looking quite hard uh, as part of our uh, uh, evidence to the pay review bodies about the uh, place of uh, financial retention incentives against core pay, uh, against specialist pay. So, getting into that sort of total reward uh, space. Um, so I think the, the, the point is that uh, a full-scale implementation uh, of the Haven for Weight Review is not a, I mean, is, is generally not a quick thing. Uh, it's a multi-year uh, endeavour, and once we get after that, there's a bunch of stuff that we want to do because the challenges around recruitment can't, can't frankly wait that long. So shall, shall I have a go at this as well? So, so I, as I said to you before, this is something that's just massively concerning me, and I accept, before other members mention it, that just because there have been applications and they're a record high for a lot of years doesn't mean they come through. And one of the things which frustrates me about the system is that you can apply, but actually getting into the armed forces through the system is painful. So I've been having many, uh, regular meetings with uh, the Chief of the Defence people. It's 13 themes that he's working uh, on, along with Min uh, DPF, F. he's now called, recently changed name. Uh, he, uh, he and I have been working very, very hard to drive those changes. And I've spoken about quite a lot of them and already started to enact 
quite a lot of those changes. So, for example, I was up at Catterick recently talking to uh, the person responsible for the army recruitment who was telling me that, you know, it is ridiculous that it, once you've applied, you'll be invited for an interview. That interview takes place in a different location to the location for your medical. So we're bringing that together. I don't need to reproduce a report to do it. We're just doing it. I've spoken before about the fact that, <coughs> and I know this can be a bit controversial, I don't personally have a beard, uh, but 54% uh, of, of men between 18 and 30 do. So we immediately exclude large numbers of people in the most of the army, for example, and many, many other things which I'm able to move on and change. I don't not needing to produce a final report. To, but to, to, to answer please, your question, I haven't, I haven't rushed to publish something until I'm happy with the process. I suppose to cut the chase, and when will we actually see any of that plan come into fruition when will it actually what what timeline have you give yourselves as a department for when you'll actually start to see changes? So I actually publish it as a formal piece of work rather and, than well, just doing the work to actually it, see the changes itself. that you're talking about yeah. when I, will we see them I, I think presently actually I mean I say I'd be more focused on trying to get the change within the system than publishing a report about it but I think we can undertake to publish that fairly soon and I'm just curious um, if anyone can help me out here um, I've been sent a recent FOI where it showed that over 125,000 applicants have been rejected from the army, including 23,000 from the Commonwealth, and they were turned down because of lack of vacancies. Is that correct? I haven't seen that actual that's what FOI. The but FOI I, see is lack of vacancies was why they were turned uh, down. I haven't seen that actual one, but I know that in the army, I think there are like 73 different kind of routes that you apply for, rather different uh, professions that you can apply into. And I don't know what, whether that's because some are full or not. I haven't seen that FOI. But, it, but any, I mean, I have seen any number of examples of what I think are crazy practices in a modern world to go and recruit people. And, you know, this is a very, very strong focus for me because I, just, I, I completely accept, particularly since there seems to be such high levels of interest, that the fact that we can't get them through the system is a real and genuine uh, problem that needs resolving. Okay. May I challenge just the, your very first sentence, if I may, just mm -hmm. for the record, that you, um, and I've absolutely read your report, and I think that um, many of those recommendations we are we're going to uh, enact, but not yet ready for war. Um, we, we are ready for war. We, 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 and I fundamentally believe that there will be a road to war. And that's we, not what we concluded, though. And but, but we have and very that was high based on the scant information we actually got. You know, mm. nobody could explain to us why information that was previously publicly available is now classified. So we could only assume that it's because it's far worse than we actually think it is. We have very. So we you have may very... disagree, but that's what we found as a committee. No, I, 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 I think your report is, from my perspective, from a military capability perspective, is exceptionally useful. But I think the message that this country is not ready for war is the wrong message on a whole range of fronts. We have very high readiness forces, many in the colour of my uniform, that can go out the door tonight, and we will have then a road to war. Uh, we would fight as an alliance, and it's all, as we've discussed before, it's about the balance of operational risk. That's the answer, not we're not ready for war. We are ready for war. Thank you, Emma. Um, Mark, do you want to come and just... Yeah, on, it follows directly from that, and then we'll come to personnel. General... There are six former MOD ministers on this committee, some other people who served, so we sort of vaguely know what we're talking about. We spent months looking at this. The MOD were very reluctant to re release a lot of sensitive information. And if you're right and we are ready for war, and I hope you are, we're not ready for an enduring war. Absolutely. Yes, you accept that. Absolutely. The problem is, Absolutely. as, we, as we, you know, we go into this in chapter and verse, but in a nutshell for brevity, sir, we couldn't fight an enduring war for more than a couple of months against Russia, drop all these euphemisms about peer adversaries. We couldn't fight Putin for more than a couple of months in a full-on shooting war because we don't have the ammunition and the reserves of equipment to do it. That's true, isn't it? True. Right. Thank you. Thank you for your candor so clearly we need to do something about that hence our great concern about the budget but i think we've made that point already to give credit where it's due this design force design review sounds good it's very much along the lines of our report if we're now looking perhaps because of this but for other reasons too you know how we can increase our actual war fighting power that's got to be a good thing when will the FFDR conclude? When do we aim to have the outcome of that? 
We, we have an outline now. Uh, it's obviously a classified level. I, I don't know what sort of negotiation we, we could have a closed session on where we've got to on yeah. that. Um, and uh, that will mature. The key, the key pop, uh, point is that it must be ready, assuming we have a review next year or the end of this year, whenever it is. We, we've got to inform that from a military capability perspective, from an operational design, force design, capability choice perspective. It must inform that. So whenever that is, it will be ready. Well, well, General, I'm looking at the chair for the risk of speaking for the committee. Given the, the tremendous amount of work that we, and for the record, our excellent clerks put into this report, I think we would very much welcome a private briefing if this exercise is complete or near complete. I'm sure the committee would very much like to be briefed on confidential terms about what that is, and maybe we could we could sort that out. Secretary of State, is that reasonable? I, 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 that's, I, sounds like a very good idea. I'm Thank very you. happy to uh, facilitate that right. for you. Excellent. I just wanted to make one small Sorry. point, only because with six former MOD ministers and lots of professional expertise here, this is taken as a given within this room. But for people watching and hearing that the UK isn't ready for war exclusively with Russia, it's important to understand that because we're in NATO and Article 5 exists, that we would never be in that situation. And in fact, if we were in a war against Russia, NATO has four times as many tanks, three times as many subs, four times as many helicopters, six times as many armoured vehicles, four and a half times as many uh, warships, eight times as many transport aircraft, uh, four times as many artillery and fires, 16 times the uh, aircraft carriers, and three times as many fighters. In other words, we would be in a very strong position. The UK is very improbable, very unlikely, that we would pick a war with Russia and not have NATO. And in 1940, the French army was far larger than the German. Anyway, yes. let's come on to recruitment. Um, take you back to defence questions of only yesterday. Uh, I, I quoted to you in the chamber, or to, to MinAF, um, an article that Larissa Brown, the defence editor of the Times, wrote on the 22nd of March, which she quotes you so very briefly. This from her article. Grant Shapps, the defence secretary, has admitted that the recruitment system is ludicrous, saying earlier this month that the Amazon generation which is used to getting things instantly, were not prepared to wait a year to join the army. That is an accurate mm. reflection of your position, sir, yes? Yes. Good. Okay. Larissa's a good journalist. I didn't think she get it wrong. So if it's ludicrous, and I think this committee would absolutely agree with that, if it's ludicrous, why is the outsourced contractor, who the chairman has asked me to call Capita today, still on contract? Why... If it's ludicrous, haven't you bitten the bullet, got rid of them and taken it back in-house? I mean, ludicrous is your word. Yeah, ludicrous is... It, my reason for ludicrous is not actually to do with the contractor, though I know you've made many representations. The, the strict answer is they're under contract, I think, extended for a year or whatever. I think they've been on a rolling contract for many years. My actual complaint is not specifically, although I'm sure there are many issues there, with just the contractor, is that the rules that we apply, and we started to get into some of them before, mean that people who uh, would quite, quite clearly be assets to our armed forces are often not allowed into our armed forces. And it starts with trivial things like uh, uh, facial hair, but goes right through to whether in 40 years' time you might have a genetic disease that suggests yes. that the actuaries say that you wouldn't be able so to So if you had asthma when you were three and all Right, uh, uh, you know, wh whereas most people serve for, for 10 years or something. So, so we, we've got to get real with the, the, the rules. So when I say it's ludicrous, I think the way that we're doing this is almost designed to put people through a, a salt course, which is about everything apart from their ability so to actually... Say, I think we're, we are in what the Americans would call violent agreements so yeah. for, for brevity. Given what the general has just said... Um, in our report, Ready for War, page 31, paragraph 75, one sentence, quote, the MOD publicly concedes that for every eight service personnel who leave, it currently recruits five people, although we understand the situation may have deteriorated further, end quote. Uh, we understand in some parts of the army, for every one that Capita somehow managed to recruit, three are now leaving. And we're particularly losing trained specialists to industry where they can earn far more. And without those avionics technicians, your planes don't fly. Without those nuclear watchkeepers, your submarines don't go to sea, and yeah. so on and so forth. So it's really serious. The armed forces are bleeding out on the operating 
table. I mean, I use that language deliberately and based on fact. So a few tweaks aren't going to cut it. What this needs is for you, sir, to cut the Gordian knot and do something very different from what we're doing at the moment, especially in the army where the challenge is greatest. So you've got your headline. What are you now going to do? Hawthorne, wait, uh, I think proposed 67 or maybe 69 different pieces of uh, action and we're working through, or different uh, themes actually, I think. Hawthorne's weight won't touch the sides. They're leaving now. Well, well, in fairness, I think you've got to start somewhere with these things, right? So he he has a whole bunch of different things which were putting people off uh, either joining or, or staying. Uh, CDP, who you actually you recommended to, to me. Well, uh, I, if you wanted uh, to put that in the public, I, I, yes, it, it is. It's right there. You, you, <laughs> you told me it was excellent, and I found you to be entirely uh, accurate. Is working day in, day out on, on this, uh, as is uh, Min DPF uh, on it, and myself, because I stand by my words. I think a system which makes it troublesome for to, for people to get in isn't in tune with the modern world. Fate takes far too long, and people have been offered other things and go elsewhere. In a fundamentally, and this is the issue, very, very tight labour market with low unemployment that means that people have a lot more uh, options. I mean, things like the 9% pay rise last year will have helped. And when I looked at, you know, why are the applications up, part of the reason is the pay oh, is well, up. So just so second state, sorry, can we, can we just get, can we dispense with this sophistry? Capita are past masters at manipulating statistics. So when you say applications are up, or expressions of interest, that is not the same as enlistments. Correct. Right. The whole problem on this contract for years is there's a, you know, lo- lots more people go on the website, click, say they're interested, maybe then go through the application process. Yeah. But very few of them actually take the king's shilling. So. I've seen ministers constantly talk about applications are up, but enlistments are down. What matters is enlistments. It's how, when people join, not when they watch a, a video. So please stop blowing smoke at us over that. We know the truth. Well, well look, I don't disagree with the difference between a click to apply and someone enlisting, so you're absolutely right about that. But it can't have been the case that in the last six years a defence minister has come to hear and said that the army applications are at six year high because they are at six year high or eight years with the Navy. So we are seeing a much higher level of application. I absolutely share your concern about getting them right through the system. The problem is, and and may well be related to the contractor, but my point is if we think that's the only problem, then we are... No, 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 one more go. Because there there are many other things. One more go. One final go. I understand, we've got three minutes. I understand. Look, recruitment is undoubtedly a challenge. You must sack. Capita, you must. But retention is an even bigger challenge. At some point, we've got to improve the recruiting, but what we've got to do is we've got to stop them leaving in droves, and they are. We visit military bases, it's our job. We talk to people more and more who are planning to leave. <coughs> so, if that's what you're going to do about recruitment, and I will. You know, you've got to sack them, sir. What are you going to do about retention? Yeah. Well, first of all, pay people better, which was one of the things. That was the biggest pay rise in the public sector uh, last year. Uh, treat people uh, better, and there have uh, you know, been entire reports on that. Make accommodation um, better, for, for, which has been, you know, last, this time last year, uh, I was reading your output, uh, not as Defence Secretary, about people waiting 12 weeks to get their boiler repaired and, and like, fortunately... So, say again? Sick or twist report. Yeah. yeah, sick or twist, yeah. So, uh, you know, and, and actually, we put this £400 million into improving the accommodation. It is starting to work. There's more we need to do on accommodation, including things I can't quite go into yet, but you're, the committee will be aware of the structure of uh, accommodation, but also the rules for uh, who uh, gets offered what, which you'll know that I acted on recently. So these quality of life reasons for being in the military are also very, very important things as well. So, uh, and I, you know, there are so many different things we're working on on the retention side, it's difficult to list, list them all here, but um, I entirely accept the premise that you both, it, a, a, a click of interest is not uh, uh, somebody enrolling. I totally accept that. And we also have to be better at the retention. I'm on this and uh, sort of 
straining every sinew. I hear what you're saying about the, 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 the contractor. My understanding is they're under, they're contracted for a, a period more, but there is a plan to change this entirely, which you're aware of as well. Uh, but my, my interest is making sure that we solve this. It's actually probably bubbled up to the number one uh, issue that is in front of me. Right, so thank you much, so, Mr. Oh. Richard, wanted to come in quickly. Yes. Very quickly, Secretary of State. On, on the, um, the length of time it's taken to get people into the army, and capita, a lot of the blame has been laid at the door of capita, <clears throat> and we've interviewed capita here. When we raised this issue with them uh, about um, previous illnesses or skin this or whatever it was when you were three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and I used an example of myself which raised their wrath a bit, they said to me, us, it's not us, it's the government. It's the MOD that actually sets the guidelines. We simply follow orders. Yeah. So if that is the case, and you've just said it is, what are you doing to give them separate orders to get people right. into the armed forces faster? Quite simply, I've ordered the service, service chiefs to go back through uh, some of these crazy rules and bring them up to date for the 21st century. Right, well, the service chief's fine, but it's, it's so, and they will tell Capita, will they? Well, they're, no, because actually, because Capita's the army. Of Capita's only the army. Yeah. And separately, um, even then, it's not just the contractor. I'm not trying to, I know, I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to sort of protect them. I'm saying it is us. It is, it is yes. our people and our systems and our rule book, which also causes the problem. But it's not just that, it's physical things as well. Like, you know, you, you, you apply, you're invited for an interview. You go for the interview, you're told to come back three weeks later and go for a medical summary. Well, three weeks in the modern era, why wasn't the medical done when you, when you, when you got there? Yeah, why isn't it the same location? We haven't even got the estate right to, to do this in, in many places. So that's going on now, is it? Yes. Right, okay, thank you very much. Bye. Thanks, Chair. Just one more quick one from me. I remember when um, Mini F was before us and he said all the work around Heathorn Weir recruitment and retention wasn't going to be cost neutral. You've said to us today that you're on it. So can you tell us how much of your budget is actually allocated to resolving this issue? That's interesting. I may have to defer to a budget expert. Uh, so, so, the to well, so our total personnel budget is about 44% of the RDEL. So give or take. Um, 44, did you say? 44% of our RDEL, so just, just under 16 billion. That's, the that's military and civilian personnel um, so it that uh, it's within that of which about two billion or so is give or take is civil service so uh, it's within that that we will need to make it cost neutral because that's the overall cost of our people we, we are yeah. alongside development of the plan we're working through what the plan will cost yeah. and there will be choices in that um, cost neutral would be good. I suspect personally, uh, cost neutral over time is probably the best that we can hope for, uh, uh, and and it will be uh, a cost uh, up front. But it's something we are still working through. That would be an issue we'll take into the next uh, the next spending review. But in the meantime, where there are uh, immediate actions that we want to get on with, then we're finding the money for it. Okay. I'll let you move on, Chair. Thank Thanks. you. Uh, thank you, Jim. Um, for a sort of initial... S oh, just before we leave that last subject, are we having problems also with delays in vetting of, uh, of applicants? Because that seems to be fairly widespread across mm. the department. Yeah. Mm. I, don't, I haven't come across a vetting issue, but you may uh, have. Well, there the have... Uh, I think the NAO uh, and your sister committee has looked at uh, vetting in government. There have been a range of challenges in uh, vetting that has led for yeah. us out of the... Uh, cabinet office, there's been a recovery plan, I understand they're now uh, hitting their uh, key performance indicators, um, but uh, uh, that has been an issue for, for us previously. What's the average delay now? Uh, I don't have that information to have. And Mrs. Also, also, how many are sort of well beyond that? If you could send us a note on that, that sure. would be helpful. If I can then move on to actually to equipment. and. The NATO Defence Production Action Plan signed, as you know, in Vilnius uh, at their summit last year. What has been achieved as a result of it, and how is it being used to support the UK defence industry? Well, um, as you know, the Prime Minister went, was, was public in Vilnius about what the UK is leading on the DPAP, as you just um, outlined, Mr Spello. And for, for the UK, that is munitions and missiles. 
and our Minister for Defence Procurement is also leading on the ground-based air defence uh, programme across NATO. So it's people within my team now uh, um, that are leading across, uh, across the department to try to encourage, and ministers have written out to, uh, to, to member states to join these particular programmes. Um, and that, that's, uh, that's starting. Uh, there's nothing I can say that we've absolutely achieved a, a multi-member state contract uh, against this particular capability, whether this standard of munition or whatever it is, but it is absolutely the aspiration that we will be saying something like that uh, by the time we get to the Washington summit in July. Um, remind me, when was the Vilnius summit last year? Um, I can't remember the exact date, but it was... Uh, That's quite a bit of time. Ju ju July, July, July 23. And I can't remember the exact date in July. Gone by, it? Yeah, absolutely. You know, you said we're starting. Yeah, it's hard. It's, 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 you know, 32 member states and uh, trying to... Uh, but we know how important it is. As the Secretary of State uh, said about 20 minutes ago, we, we're going to fight as an alliance. We fight as NATO. And therefore, having commonality of munitions, commonality of missiles, air defence systems is important. But as we've said before, the weakness of the alliance is the alliance, but the strength of the alliance is the, is, is the alliance. And so we've got well, to work through that. are going to be involved. And, and we don't, we're not looking for 32 either. We're not looking for 32 either. We haven't written out to 32. Oh. We've written out to those member states that we think have the industrial capacity and the requirement to meet the same needs as us. If I may, I mean, at Defence Ministerials, I think in, in February, just to bring um, uh, up to date, uh, we agreed in principle, I think, with 14 partners, 13 or 14, uh, uh, a willingness to engage on both the munitions and the missiles, uh, uh, multinational. Multinational is 15. Uh, well, it's 15, 15 okay. in total. Um, uh, and as, as the general says, the, the intent through the engagement now is to uh, both uh, aggregate demand and get to some specific procurement proposals, uh, which ideally we will be able to announce by the uh, Washington summit. We're also doing quite a lot of work on NATO standardisation. Uh, 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 both thinking about how they are fit for purpose and uh, ensuring that we are following those. Uh, and there's quite a lot of work going on through Mr. Stark, who's our uh, National Armaments Director, General Office is the Deputy National Armaments Director, uh, around how you use that aggregated demand signal to increase industrial uh, capacity. But I was having that conversation in a uh, NATO context rather than, uh, for example, the EU uh, defence industrial strategy that's recently been uh, been launched. Just, by, just sorry, just on on that the uh, the thing that we signed at NATO uh, in February is the multinational procurement initiative, initiative MPI, and it's a UK initiative, and we brought 14 partners with us, so that's the 15 partners in it. All of that's encouraging, but at the same time, there is it's not being about being ready for war. There's a war on at the mm -hmm. moment mm -hmm. and there does not still seem to be that sense of urgency Secretary of State you very kindly wrote to me in response to questions that I've been raising in Parliament about the 155 millimeter, and you said in that uh, in, in that letter um, following a significant increase in the requirement for 155 millimeter artillery ammunition in April of 23 the Ministry of Defence worked with BAE the need for 155mm uh, uh, ammunition was clear well in, uh, back in 22. And indeed the United States resp were responding much earlier. Uh, New York Times of January in 23 said the Pentagon was racing to produce production of all artillery shells by 500%. They're building a whole new capacity down in uh, down in Dallas, and they're also uh, uh, I can't remember whether it's an explosives or a propellants ca capability in Arkansas, and yet we only signed our agreement with BAE in um, in July of 2023. How, don't we have a system problem I mean, in responding look, to crisis? Uh, obviously, it's before my time. I do know, and I think I probably mentioned that letter. We're now doing an eight times. Uh, the level of 155 production um, with that uh, with that signing, and I noticed that Germany, even later than that, have finally started to build a factory uh, which will look to produce more munitions. But if the general charge is, um, you know, uh, the, the, the world is too slow to produce and, and provide things to this existential war in Europe, then, then frankly, I agree. Um, I think probably to defend my predecessors and, and the department. 
I think many people would have hoped that the war would have been over quicker and, and perhaps you know, munitions and particularly things like 155s, which were largely being purchased from elsewhere in the earlier stages of the war, uh, would have been um, sufficient. But, you know, we are where we are. We have done, uh, we have, you know, really stepped up. And you use the American example. I will use this public forum to say it would be wonderful, and I think in America's own interests, if they can now get some of that ammunition to Ukraine, because it's one thing being able to manufacture it, it's another thing being able to help Ukraine, and they don't have to do it because in the United States Congress it's Europe asking for it, and somehow we're trying to claim there's some moral reason for them to come and help on another continent, but through their own self-interest of ensuring that dictators elsewhere don't think that you can take advantage of the Western coalition uh, by simply waiting for us to get some form of attention deficit after a couple of years. Uh, of of war, so I think for all those reasons, it's important that new manufacturing capacity gets to Ukraine. But even if the requirement for Ukraine ended tomorrow, way back again in 22 and all the way through 23, it was crystal clear that the security environment in Europe had changed dramatically, and that we were going to require to be on a better war footing. The previous armed forces minister seemed blissfully unaware of the evidence of General Hodges to this committee, previous head of the uh, US Army in Europe, that in an exercise the UK Army ran out of munitions in 10 days. And even and the General was saying that for a major war that we would run out of some material, I think a month, a month, a month or, a yeah. month or so. So it was clear that that, uh, that that situation had changed. But there doesn't seem to be the initiative uh, in, inside the system to move this forward. How are you going to change that? One of the things that is one of the supplementals, so controversially not in the Red Book, but it is for the weapon stockpile, uh, which is very important. Um, and it might be that the General wants to come in. Well, this goes back to the point we were, I was discussing with Mr Francois. We absolutely agree that we need to uh, endure in a war. Yes. And I wouldn't be doing my job if I wasn't absolutely responding to what you just said. And we're absolutely doing what you've just said. We, uh, we've, we've written a munition strategy. We're now developing a plan. We are determined to commit a certain level of munitions over a certain period of time. Uh, industry have helped us write these documents. And so the point you're making is absolutely critical to fight to war fight in an enduring way. And uh, we are, that is probably my number one priority in terms of we're going to work every day. Industry needs contracts in order to do that. Can I just absolutely? Think, well, if I may, Mr. Speller, I mean the, the the contract, if you like, was the, the the sort of the culmination of a process of engagement. So, for BA Systems on ammunition, for Tyler's actually picking up the production run of Enlaw again, for MBDA, uh, we had signed. Now, I I would have to go and check whether it was uh, late 21 or early 22, but uh, a set of letters of comfort for those companies to begin investing in production capacity while we work through what our requirement would be uh, and what a contract uh, over a number of years might then look like. So it's not that we we thought about it in April 23 and then signed a contract. It's the culmination of uh, I, I should also, just for completeness, mention the International Fund for Ukraine, which despite its name is actually a British fund which we invite international partners to join, which has now raised over £900 million and laid 27 separate contracts for lots of things, including munitions. So we, we haven't been sitting on our, you know, back sides. And a long-term procurement uh, for a particular company um, it, it will be made public uh, very soon. We've just had approval. OK, if I could just move, move on to Boeing, because the, uh, your predecessor mm. paused the uh, contract for the uh, Chinooks uh, uh, coming in, and, but you've now gone ahead, uh, gone ahead with that. Um, how many, how many um, Chinooks are we ordering? Which variant? And what's been the, what's been the costing? The one, uh, 14, uh, the extended uh, range um, type. Um, the, I looked at this very, very carefully, just in terms of context on this, um, and visited the US as well on it, uh, with a completely open mind about potentially not going um, ahead. Um, there was a very large... Uh, cost to not going ahead given where the plan had got to uh, but actually because my predecessor had uh, uh, frozen it I was also able to go back and negotiate essentially a hefty discount some 300 million pounds uh, on it uh, and also I think more importantly uh, used it as a discussion to also obtain 
uh, FMS reform, which is costing us hundreds of millions of pounds, um, because although we've never been refused a piece of equipment that we were trying to buy from the States, we constantly come up with delays, uh, which could be six months, it could be two years, uh, before we get approval, even though, as their closest ally, we'd always end up getting approval. And that process itself was causing us to have to delay backfill uh, and make um, financially inconsistent decisions. So I think, actually, although the £300 million off is the sort of top line, the FMS reform is actually the more important part from my perspective, and I was pleased to be able to uh, get pledges on that front. So you saved £300 million on, yeah. uh, on, uh, and so what was the original price, and what's the price you paid? Yes, yeah, so I, I, so I haven't got the numbers in front of me. Uh, and, and the price, we paid, is one, the price we paid is £1.5 billion. One point five million. Yeah. Billion. Billion. Yeah. One point five billion. So that's over. Um, that's a over a hundred million uh, a, a craft, a, a platform. Yes. Well, that, that one, well, it includes the sustainment costs as well, through life. What do you mean by sustaining costs in that context? Well, in terms of the ability to uh, to ensure that you can um, operate them. You buy them, but you've got to operate. Does that mean they're going to maintain them? Is this a is this a service contract or is it a sales contract? Who's actually going to maintain them? Boeing. Hmm? Boeing. Boeing are going to do all the maintenance on the. Uh, cu- currently, we have a contract with um, Boeing for Apache and Chinook, and in fact, we are going through a process now where we're going to uh, um, uh, make that more efficient. Uh, let me be in clear. this country, that's run for both Apache and Chinook. Um, uh, maintenance is run from the United Kingdom. But Boeing have had, had history of, su- of reneging on some of these arrangements and suddenly taking the work back to the States. I've experienced that. But let's so you're saying that p- the 100 million per uh, is a through life contract for each, each one of these, which includes their maintenance and upgrades as well. We'll, we'll have to get you the, the, I think out of committee, we'll have to get you the breakdown of the costs yeah. associated with the... ...being managed. I think we'll we have, would we'll, be... We'll, very we'll provide that all for you. That would, that, that would be very helpful. One final question, uh, Chairman. Were any members of the government on board the submarine uh, with the failed uh, missile? Uh, I was. Um, but I just want to, just for clarity purposes, perhaps um, mention that the slightly odd language of a, uh, an event-specific anomaly um, actually was in relation to a piece of test equipment which is not on an actual missile file fire. So the reason that the recertification was able to complete was that the ship performed perfectly, the crew were exceptional, the uh, actual firing out of the uh, sub uh, worked perfectly, Without the piece of test equipment, this would have uh, hit target. So in a live fire, it would have uh, been on target, which is why uh, the, the, the the boat, rather, on the ship, should, was able to go back into recertifi- recertification. Just as a matter of interest, is it usual, because these happen from time to time, is it usual for uh, ministers to be on board? I'm not, I'm not sure. I, I do not know. Um, in, in my experience, yes. No. I mean, for the, for the particular data firing, there is normally a... Uh, US and UK VIP delegation. Right. Can I just come back to Chinook very quickly? This is according to an very MOD quickly. briefing note. Yeah, this is your note. The, e- the E7 Wedgetail, the AWACS aircraft, years late, 10% UK content. The AH64 Apache, 7% UK content. The P8 Poseidon, 4% UK content. Previous CH-47s, it says here, 2% UK content. So that's virtually nothing in the UK. And when you add those four programmes together, you are talking billions and billions of dollars. And you've just spent £1.5 billion in sterling to buy these helicopters from a company that's just wiped out its own senior management. So hang on. When you do us this note... To clarify the costs of the contract, what's paid for, what's the additional support costs, you're going to give us chapter and verse. Could you also clarify how much of that is going to be spent in the UK? Yes, and and, and that's why we produced this note. This is the this is the note in terms of what to answer that question. But since since the conversation we had last time and produced the note, I've personally been to Boeing uh, in Crystal City, 
and I've relayed this conversation. The next negotiation we're going to have with Boeing is on uh, Chinook uh, Tranche 2, so the, repla the, the, the replacement of our current model. And I'm going to go along with our National Armaments Director, the head of DNS, Andy Start, to have a conversation with Boeing if our replacement for the current Chinook is the, is the, is the next block, block so-called Block 2, it will be exactly along the lines you've just said. That how are Boeing going to continue to invest in the United Kingdom? So if you we're say going to continue to invest, we spent billions and billions with them over the last twenty years, and what they give back to British industry is peanuts. The, 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 the situation is changing with Boeing. I know Can I just <laughs> can I just jump in as, as, as well on it? So so I, mean, I think the there are a lot of problems on the civil side, which you um, pointed out. Uh, I agree we want to procure here. That's why we've got the integrated procurement model. That's why you guys have helped us in developing that model. One of the things that it does is it massively increases the uh, ability to export as being part of the uh, competitive uh, process, plus all the spiral development we've talked about um, before. Uh, and when it comes to a helicopter like, uh, in particular, like the uh, Chinook, there isn't, you know, apart from, I think, a, a Chinese knockoff, there isn't anything else which can do what that does. And this one will do it for twice the distance as well, which will be of great use potentially to our special forces and others. So I think that um, you know, you're right about your concern, but I actually also think we've got a plan, in part because of this committee's work, for making this better in the future, which I look forward to doing. There's a reason John, why that's must the, have... the only option, and that's because MOD and the RF in particular has consistently not place their orders with British no. industry and has placed it with American industry. So not only is it expensive, not only are we being affected by the dollar pound exchange rate, but also, but, but also we become dependent on them and they know it. Which is why we're so pleased with this plan that you've helped us with. Let's move on. I, one, I want Martin to have five minutes, which takes us over time, <laughs> on the um, National Defence Plan. This is a very, very quick answer, I hope, to a very good question. ESG, we saw the announcement in the budget um, that the FCA are going to be looking at uh, the SG rating providers. That isn't something you've neglected. I'm sure you're going to carry on pushing it. I mean, there's a moral imperative here Absolutely. that we don't get anywhere. Uh, we don't get schools and hospitals that we want if we haven't got uh, peace and security. And I hope that this is a message that the department is constantly pushing out. I feel incredibly strongly about it. When I uh, hear from um, financiers who uh, refuse to back Defence, and I tell them about the school or the nursery that was uh, uh, bombed out for the Ukrainian family who came and stayed with me, and I went to see that uh, uh, those actually flats above, across from the uh, from the kindergarten. I say to these financiers, how can the moral thing be to allow uh, for uh, that to happen and not to be prepared to finance the defence of you know defenceless people at the moment in Ukraine and elsewhere? So, in my view, there's absolutely an open and closed case for investment in uh, defence, and um, I, I think it, that's the moral stance. Thank you. Now, Secretary, I hope you don't mind if we just have got run over by three minutes, say, just to allow Martin to have his last question, if that's all right. Yeah, thanks, Chair. And just in terms of the Department currently working on the National Defence Plan, I wonder if you could maybe, in terms of strategic readiness, say something about interdepartmental working uh, and also about how if permanent secretaries are engaging not only across departments here in Whitehall but across uh, Cardiff, uh, Edinburgh and of course there will be different arrangements for the civil service in Northern Ireland. A very good example of interdepartmental working yesterday with the launch of the command uh, paper, the nuclear command paper, um, the Prime Minister and Chancellor were up in uh, Barrow uh, and that involved you know, defence, uh, levelling up, uh, DFE on qualifications, uh, and so on and so forth. I mean, it, it was an extraordinary number of departments involved. So it's very good sort of, and, and, and making things like nuclear a national endeavour um, has really shifted that uh, in a big way. Um, the other thing is I, I spend a lot of time, defence is clearly quite, or very international in nature, so barely a week goes away when I don't leave the, the, the country. Last week into the weekend I was in Australia with the Foreign Secretary. We do a lot of two plus two type uh, of work, so there's a lot of integration uh, there as well. Um, but there'll be um, you know, many different examples. Uh, yeah, and for the second part of your question, uh, if I take a step back uh, and think firstly more broadly about uh, resilience and strategic risk, um, permanent secretaries uh, 
uh, including colleagues uh, from uh, uh, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, uh, are uh, routinely and increasingly discussing questions around resilience, uh, around uh, around risk, uh, uh, including shocks to um, uh, the continuity of delivery of public services, uh, not just in a defence context. Uh, we have joined up work around the national security uh, risk assessment uh, and our expectation on the national defence plan, uh, working both with the national security secretariat uh, and then the uh, the resilience part uh, of the cabinet office, uh, is that this will support and prompt a broader conversation about a, a whole of government view uh, rather than simply a military contribution to it. So uh, it's a theme, I think, look, uh, partly building on our collective experience during COVID, uh, partly thinking about um, uh, the uh, risks from uh, an increasingly dangerous world, uh, thinking, uh, I mean, topical this week in Parliament uh, about, you know, the cyber threat. Uh, resilience is a conversation across the, uh, the sort of group of permanent secretaries on a, a routine basis. And, and just in terms of Parliament, how do you do that? How do you have that engagement with us as parliamentarians to ensure that we are on board? Well, politically, we may have disagreements in certain policy areas. Mm. In terms of readiness, how do you involve parliamentarians in that discussion? So I, I think actually just going back to this integrative procurement model, this would be a, a good example of the, certainly the way I'd like to work. And I came to this committee, I proposed or was asked whether the committee could be involved, the committee was involved before we actually published the plans to comment on it. I think it's a better document because of it. That would be a very good example and uh, I think it's a very useful way to, uh, to operate. And just finally, um, I hope you don't mind me asking, but the Prime Minister this morning stated it very clear that Ministers of, uh, of Government should comply um, with public inquiries of us to. I wonder, as Secretary of State for Defence, if you agree with the Prime Minister? Of course. Thank you. So, lastly, timings on the defence plan. Um, it's just been through sort of senior level official uh, consideration, and it'll be submitted to ministers shortly, but it's really about teeing up. Uh, some investment choices alongside the, I'm tempted to say FFDR now, uh, the, the force design work that the General is leading. Uh, so we are thinking both about capability choices for uh, war fighting abroad alongside capability choices for defence of the UK. Might uh, we see homeland. something public by the summer recess? Uh, I don't think you'll <coughs> see something public uh, by this summer recess, uh, and in any case the plan itself is quite... Uh, it's quite classified. Uh, I think there's something for us to explore, as the Secretary State suggests, about uh, what a uh, closed session engagement with the committee might look like as we develop and, and refine the plan. Thanks, sir. We've covered a lot of ground. It's been a very helpful session. Thank you all very much, Secretary of State, Mr. Williams, Mr. Whitman. General, uh, much appreciated. And thank, thank you. you. And I close the session. Thanks.